Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're just gonna wait a couple more minutes to allow more people to join and then we'll start. Okay, I think we can start and then uh, more people I, I hope will, will join us in the future. So good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to have you here with us today. And thanks for joining our webinar on data challenges. My name is Pavel and I will be moderating today's event. And joining me as uh, speakers, as panelists, are Freya from the city of Ghent. We have also Levon from the Flanders region and we have Matteo from Isle Malinou in France. I would like to start with some technical details. Um, all participants will be muted by default during the, uh, the webinar, but please uh, make use of the chat function if you have any immediate questions. We'll also be uh, monitoring the chat regularly and uh, collecting all your questions. Then speakers will be able to address them at the end during the Q&A. At this point, you can also raise your hand if you would like to comment or ask another question and we'll unmute you. Uh, let me also say that the webinar today is the first in a series of four that we're going to run in the coming months. And this webinar series is part of the larger Polyviso training package that includes an online course and workshops. Um, the latter are on hold at the moment due to COVID restrictions. Now, what is uh, Polyvisio? Now, Polyvisio, if some of you don't know, it's a European project uh, funded under the Horizon 2020 program. We are a collective effort uniting 15 partners from uh, six different countries with demonstration activities running in uh, five cities and one region. And we have representatives of three of the cities with us today who will be sharing their story very shortly. Now, Polyvisi was uh, created uh, in response to a need for more uh, fact-based policy measures. And uh, we believe that uh, some policies uh, do fail to achieve their objectives. And take an example of uh, Kyoto Protocol. You know, despite setting very ambitious 
carbon emission targets in 1997, many cities, uh, including Paris, have suffered highest level of pollution in decades. I will take another example from transport, for example. The prevailing thinking for many decades has been that if you have a congestion problem, then you can simply uh, deal with it by adding more lanes. But what we've learned, and this has been confirmed by many studies, is that adding more lanes simply adds to the problem. If you increase road capacity by 10%, then what you'll see is the increase in traffic is measured by kilometers or miles driven in that area by the same amount over a period of time. So it doesn't work. So clearly you need more data-driven, agile policy making. The good thing is that in recent years, we've seen an explosion of data. And some even call it a data tsunami. Uh, thanks to all the sensors and social media and other data collection and analytical tools, we now have more data collected in the past few years than in just about the whole of history. But what's important to keep in mind is that data obtains its value only when it's used. And previous studies showed that only about 12% of the data collected by cities is used and analyzed for decision making. So this is where Polyvisu comes in. Polyvisu was uh, created to help decision makers at different levels of government get the most of their data through advanced analytics and visualizations. We would like to enable policymakers to experiment with different policy options and to assess their impacts before implementing them on the ground. And thanks to Polyvisu, we hope that uh, policymaking can become more collaborative. Decision makers would be able to harness the collective wisdom of the crowd in order to make policies better and more citizen-centric. In other words, Polyvisu is not just a piece of technology, it's actually a new mindset and a new way of thinking about transport. And what we did in this project is we took the traditional policymaking cycle and we enhanced it with city data, which includes different types of data from social media to sensor data, open government data, also data held privately by businesses and public actors. And we processed it using open source advanced analytical tools. And what we learned in the project is that you can be uh, as a government body or as a city administration at different levels of the policy making cycle, whether it's design, implementation or evaluation. And at each of these stages, you're going to encounter some data related problems. And in this webinar, we wanted to share with you some of the problems that our pilot cities have encountered and how they went about addressing their problems. So without further ado, I would now like to invite Freya from uh, the city of Ghent to tell their story. Hi. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Pavel, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, very happy to see a lot of people have joined. Um, do I have the meeting controls? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm giving the lessons learned from Ghent, which is a city in Belgium. Um, it's not a large city, but also not a small city. But um, the main characteristic of Ghent is uh, the students. Ghent is a student city. In uh, 2017, there were over 76,000 students. Their number uh, rises each year. Um, and there are a lot of institutions for high, higher education. Now, these students can either live in Ghent, um, then they are registered in the population register. They can commute from their homes uh, with public transport or a car to the city, or they can reside in Ghent, which means that they live in Ghent during the week while they're having classes, and they go home during the weekends uh, to get their laundry done or get some food for the next week. Um, now, if like 76,000 students enter the city during the week and leave during the weekend or the holidays, this has a huge impact on the livability of the city. This has an influence on housing, on mobility, on the economy. Um, but we do not know yet how to measure this impact and how we can visualize it. Um, so we took the opportunity in this project um, to measure this and visualize it. And the main goal is to ensure that the city remains livable and that there is a healthy mix um, between student houses and family homes. Um, and like this, the city will be more livable and sustainable. 
And to illustrate where the students come from, uh, this is a map that shows um, where the students that are studying in Ghent have their official address, so where they are officially living. So the green uh, circle is Ghent, and then the red dots illustrate where they are from, and you show that they're from everywhere in Flanders. Now we encountered a few data challenges um, while we want to explore this, this policy problem. Uh, the first challenge, we wanted to know where the students are living, where they are living when they are residing in Ghent during the week. This would be most easily solved if there, were, if there were a central registry with addresses of students, if we knew where they were living, but this does not exist. We could say, well, it doesn't exist, we can construct one. Um, but unfortunately, because there is no legal um, um, framework for this, the students and the institutions for higher education are quite reluctant to share addresses of students. So this was the first data challenge. Um, and then obviously, if you're working with big data and uh, student addresses is quite a big data set, you need specific expertise to handle these data sources. We also use some experimental data sources. This requires a specific um, expertise from people who are handling the data. So I already said that we did not have a central register and we had to look for different data sources uh, to solve the problem of knowing where the students reside when they're in Ghent. Um, and we tried to explore different data sets. The first cluster of data sets were administrative data sources. For instance, we have um, some list for university colleges from um, institutions for higher education that have addresses of students or um, student homes, like big homes where a lot of students reside. Uh, we also conducted a door-to-door -door field survey, which gives some limited data. We have some um, lists that come from prevention and safety checks performed by the firefighters. And we also have a civil servant who's responsible for students that also has some data. But this was not sufficient to solve our policy problem. Now we started thinking how we um, could um, implement more experimental data sources. Uh, social media has become more popular, especially students are probably using it. Uh, we thought, let's see if we could use uh, data from Facebook or Twitter. Um, apparently Facebook does uh, shield their data quite well right now. We could not access the data when we developed an app. So we abandoned that idea pretty quickly. Um, and then on Twitter, I will show you on the map um, what the result was of that. We tried to see where the location was of someone who tweeted in Ghent. But you see there is a huge hotspot here right at the city center. as because if there was no location available, it all went back to this location. And all the other locations, there's not sufficient data to make any conclusions of that. So we also abandoned that idea. We also explored whether we could use utility services data, for instance, um, from electrical companies. If they're at a certain house, there's electricity usage during the week, but not during the weekends. Um, this could imply that students are living there. Um, and we also had some data from City Mesh, which measures crowd data um, through Wi-Fi sniffing, but that contract recently ended. Um, so the data source that we decided to work with was telecom data from Proximus. Um, we contacted Proximus very early in the process, had multiple brainstorms with them, whiteboard sessions, tried to uh, define how we would identify students um, from mobile phones. Uh, how do we know which mobile phone belongs to a student and which one doesn't? Um, but we def defined a pattern where um, you get a probability of being a student when you're in the city during the week when there are classes, but not during the weekend or during holidays or specific student holidays. Um, so we defined the pattern um, together with Proximus. Um, we also tried to um, explore with them what kind of results we wanted and how they would deliver the data. So this took quite some time actually. And then we had two iterations of results. The first one was a testing phase in 2019, where we had one month of data. Um, we got some preliminary results. We uh, gave feedback. Uh, some things were changed, tweaked. And now we recently got the results of three months of data from 2020. Um, we only got them a few weeks ago, so we're still doing some preliminary visualizations and uh, I will take you quickly through them. I will not describe the results in detail because it's a bit out of the scope of this presentation, but show you the different visualization tools that we decided to use. 
because uh, it's also an important part of the PolyVisu project. So we, um, up to now, we use three different visualization tools. Um, the first one I will show is Power BI. Um, this one is very easy to use. That's why we're trying to use it throughout the city. And what we see here is the way the data is delivered by Proximus. We get cells. Um, the cells are defined by where the, um, by Proximus themselves. And for every cell, we get the number of students that are measured within a certain time period. But one student can be in different cells uh, during that time period if they move. So this is a representation during the academic year and this during the Christmas holidays. We see that activity is in the city center, which kind of makes sense. And that most students are gone during the Christmas holidays, which also makes sense. The second tool we used was QGIS, um, which is more for, it's, it's better performing when you want to uh, make maps and things like that. And this uh, map will make sense for everyone who's familiar with Ghent. Uh, we zoomed in a bit on the city center. Um, so we again have the cells and the number of students that have been measured um, per cell, but we also see um, the institutions for higher education. So we see during the day, that the students are a bit more scattered throughout the city center, a bit clustered around the institutions for higher education. While at night, we see that there is a, a big hotspot here. This is the Overpoort, it's where a lot of um, student bars are, and um, some dorms are here as well. So this kind of makes sense. And the third tool, a colleague of mine developed a Python dashboard to um, visualize the data. Um, this requires a very specific expertise, so it's quite nice that you could do this. And this shows um, on the hourly data, you can also select a cell and then uh, see per hour how many students have been measured. And so it's nice to have these three different visualization tools because they each have their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, so what do we learn from um, our pilot is that when we're collecting data sources, think broad, explore different options, do brainstorm sessions, talk to people about what they would like to see as ideal data source um, and try to come up with something original. It can be quite inspiring to do this. Then when you're working with a commercial partner, as we did, it's good to make good agreements beforehand, um, but also be open and honest. Uh, make sure they know what you're expecting. Um, that way it's easier to get it. Um, when you're implementing the data, um, collaboration with partners with a specific expertise is key. You've seen, it especially with the visualizations, but also analyzing the data. Um, it's not easy, and it's not straightforward. It's not one person is able to know all of this uh, expertise. So um, have people in the project within the city, but also external expertise use it for, uh, for the data analysis, analysts. And then when you're doing the um, visualization process, when you're exploring the data, um, use different tools. This is a work in progress. Don't uh, fix with a specific tool. Um, we were very happy to be able to use different tools for this. Um, and now I'm going to give the word back to Pavel. Thank you, Freya, for a very interesting presentation and the case study. Yeah, so um, now we are at the end of the Ghent case study and we would like um, our audience, our participants to share um, very quickly with us um, their reactions to, this, to the case study. And I will launch now a flash poll. You should see, you should see it on your screen and I will keep it open for maybe around a minute. And we will not uh, discuss the results immediately, but we will leave it for the Q&A part, um, which we will have at the end of the uh, presentations. So please, uh, I would like to kindly ask everyone in the audience to vote on these two questions. I see that uh, 24 people out of 34 have voted. So if I could ask the remaining 10 to cast their votes, that would be fantastic.
five more people need to vote. So I don't know if, if that's possible to just uh, encourage you to, to vote now. But maybe these people are away from keyboard, so I don't know. Um, yeah, four more remaining. Okay, I will. Um, we're at 31 out of 34. I'm gonna end the poll now and share the results with you. Um, so we will take a look at it in more detail uh, at the end of all three presentations. Okay, and now we will hear from Levin uh, about the Mechlin and Flanders use case. And Levin, I'm going to give controls to you now. Yep. Thank you, Pavel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Pavel uh, said, I will um, go into detail in particular to uh, a case uh, we have done together, uh, Flanders and um, the city of Mechelen in Flanders, uh, located in between Brussels and Antwerp. Um, uh, in Flanders, we have, uh, in Polyvisu, we have worked on different uh, pilot cases and some of them will be presented in one of our next uh, webinars. Um, so today, um, yeah, I, I want to present um, this pilot case in particular because it deals with, let's say, the aspect of policy evaluation and also with the aspect of uh, citizen participation and uh, citizen science. Okay, so in Mechelen, the policy question where everything started with was uh, the fact that the city of Mechelen wants to measure the impact and effect of, uh, the, impl of the implementation, implementing a school street, um, and in fact, measuring the, the traffic around the school. Um, maybe just a few words about the school street. Um, it's um, a traffic measure that uh, was implemented legally um, somewhere at mid 2018 and in fact allows uh, local communities um, to block um, the street where uh, a school is located uh, for mainly car traffic um, um, during those moments of the day when children go to school or children leave the school and uh, go back to their homes. So um, in most um, school streets um, the period that uh, the street is blocked is something in between one hour and one and a half hour um, during morning peak and the same during the evening peak. Um, so we started in fact from an existing citizen science project which is called uh, Telegram and you can see one of the devices on the right hand side of your screen. Um, a Telegram which means abacus in, in English but means also um, translated in, in Dutch um, counting window in fact um, and it's in fact a, a small computer uh, with a camera which is able to measure um, cars, um, measure um, big cars, um, lorries etc uh, but also cyclists and pedestrians. Um, it's installed already in Flanders in a few hundred uh, streets, something in between 700 and 900, if I'm right. Um, but um, what's the case now and what you see on the screen is you have already a kind of dashboard um, giving information of each of the streets uh, individually. Uh, but what we have done uh, here in Polyvisu is in fact worked on a dashboard um, around the school uh, and you see here the school street. So here is the entrance of the school and here you see the street where the, the school is located. And of course we want to know, and the city of Mecklen wants to know um, what uh, the effect is um, of the implementation of a school street. So we did the pre and the post measurement um, just before the lockdown period in fact uh, of COVID-19. Uh, we were able to, let's say, um, to get a results somewhere of a period around four weeks, two weeks, roughly two weeks before and two weeks after the implementation of the school streets. But we have also measured uh, the traffic in the surrounding streets, what you see here. So we have rolled out something like 10 cameras and um, we can in fact um, measure the traffic in the school street and in the surrounding streets because of course, uh, people living in the surrounding 
also wants to know what's the effect um, on their, uh, in their environment, in their uh, local neighborhood. So um, we have built a dashboard. Uh, we have then implemented, uh, let's say, a weather engine to see uh, what's, uh, how the weather influences, of course, uh, the people going to school. And especially, we are interested to see um, how many cyclists uh, are going to the school and just to see what, what the effect is of the, uh, of the cyclists. Um, and um, we were also able to uh, see the differences uh, between the two periods, um, let's say in total numbers, but also uh, in a relative way, so uh, by percentages. Um, what was the policy objective um, in a more concrete way? It was in fact about uh, having a more sustainable model split. And in fact, uh, we are uh, mostly interested here in the number of cyclists and the number of pedestrians. Um, the number of pedestrians are a little bit more difficult to uh, measure in the school street because uh, when people drop off their children just um, at the beginning of the school street, um, they are measured in the school street as a pedestrian, but in fact they came by car. And that's not an effect we, we notice um, with cyclists. Um, we have also the possibility to, um, to measure um, the effect in the school street and in the neighbor street in terms of model splits, but we can do that also after and before the uh, school street was implemented. And in fact, it gives us um, the uh, possibility to, um, yeah, to, to, to measure the effect um, of the school street measure. And it, of course, uh, it also has to do with uh, the fact of evidence-based policy making, which is very important in the Polyviso project. Uh, what's also important is the fact that we are dealing here with public participation. So we asked people um, of course, to, um, to install such uh, a Telram uh, at Abacus before their window. And we see very stable results in a way that um, during the whole period, also during the COVID period, that um, in fact, every camera that was installed uh, three, four months ago is still running right now. So people are still measuring uh, the data. And it's in fact important to get those people on board. What are the data challenges? Um, yeah, first of all, getting good local traffic count data. And in fact, in Flanders, we have the case, it's the case that we have uh, counting data on our main uh, road network, but it's uh, far more difficult to get good counting data in our neighborhoods where uh, in fact uh, people live, where their homes are, uh, etc. So the Talram in that respect is a great citizen science project that helps to solve that problem. Um, we are also testing um, together with, uh, with a private company uh, with um, MUC, who is working with uh, ENPR cameras, cameras for number plate recognition. But they have also developed in the frame of this project a camera that uh, just also counts traffic um, in a little bit more detailed way than the, the citizen science um, uh, devices can. So we are also, uh, we will also try um, to, um, yeah, to check, um, let's say, the correctness of those two type of, um, of, of measure instruments. So we have done, as said before, a pre and a post measurement. Um, we are also planning to install a second school uh, in Mechelen. Um, it was planned, in fact, in this period, um, but we will uh, shift that to the period of September uh, when hopefully schools are um, opening again. Um, it gives us also insight into um, other data. Um, so we are also combining the effect of school holidays uh, on the traffic in uh, the neighborhoods. Um, we have also linked with the source of weather information. Um, we are also interested for, let's say, the far future uh, or further future to um, integrate probably with um, air quality sensors as well. Um, and we have also uh, the aspect of data outages. So our solution is a dashboard. Um, what was new um, is in, was the fact that we are, uh, let's say, have more information um, that is useful for policymaker by connecting multiple um, 
traffic sensors. Uh, so by connecting them, um, we uh, were able to, let's say, um, added some additional value um, on, let's say, the, uh, the project, uh, the, the map uh, you saw with all the individual uh, camera information. So by connecting them, we are able to use them uh, in, a, in a policy context. context. Um, we also um, worked with a clear policy goal, and I think that's also important in dashboards, that you are measuring your results against uh, a policy goal, and uh, this is probably a little bit sensitive for a, lo a lot of local communities, uh, because uh, what if uh, we are not able to reach our goal, uh, how the people will react, um, because this dashboard is open for everyone uh, to visit. Um, so that's also a little bit uh, sensitive for local communities, and um, um, and it's yeah something we want to encourage uh, by those local communities. Um, it's also important that the data on your portal is easy to interpret and to use. So it's not only meant for uh, policymakers, but also for uh, the public involved uh, in the whole project and even beyond your citizens uh, living in the neighborhood. Um, what we also did is um, all the information measured by the sensors is also available directly on the dashboard as a downloadable, uh, downloadable data file. So uh, people can also start playing with it as well. Um, so in this project, we were able to uh, integrate more than 10 sensors. Um, we um, had a kind of policy uh, norm uh, goal of 100 cyclists uh, measured uh, during uh, the morning and 100 also during the evening peak. Um, we want to make the data and uh, the results reusable. Um, so, um, in fact, this is yeah, what uh, our dashboards uh, provide as a solution. Um, in our interface today, we have already the possibility for uh, other schools to, uh, to join us and to join the platform. And so we can easily roll it out to multiple schools. And so um, this is not only the case for Flanders, but uh, other uh, regions or uh, countries where they know the concept about school streets can in fact also directly use this, um, this uh, interface and this dashboard as well. This is for example, the case in Italy where they also uh, have this uh, school street concept uh, rolled out already. Um, some recommendations. Um, yeah, public involvement is, uh, is the key here. Uh, citizen science as an enabler for policy making. Uh, it's very important to attract you to, to let's say, um, attract people, but also keep them involved. Uh, good data itself is not enough to, uh, to involve your citizens and to, um, to attract them. Uh, so you also have to come with some uh, real outcomes. Um, which affects their daily life. Um, so it's about what you do with the data. Um, and in that respect, we found out that a clear policy goal uh, really helps, easy to interpret visualizations and also the uptake by the local politicians, which is also the case in the city of Mechelen. In the near future, we will also work on more gamification where you can compare, for example, different uh, school environments with each other uh, with questions like, uh, which is uh, the school area where we have seen um, the biggest increase in model splits or something like that. And we also are thinking to make this concept applicable in other domains as well. Uh, for example, uh, to measure the outcomes of uh, the implementation of local uh, mobility plans, uh, measuring, for example, traffic around hospitals, shopping areas, etc. I think, um, yeah, with some adaptations, you have a lot of domains where you can um, work with, uh, with such a kind of, uh, of a dashboard. Thank you. Pavo. Pavel, I think your your um, your microphone is shut off. Mm. 
Now I'm back on. It was uh, hard, for, hard for us to control the cursor at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Livan, very much. No, you're, you're still controlling the screen. Ah, OK. So if you just go back. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, so I'm, I'm going to control the cursor from now on, just to make okay. it easier for, Sorry. for everyone to follow. Sorry to the audience for, um, for this hiccup. Uh, we would like everyone again to quickly uh, share with us uh, your thoughts on the Flanders use case. Um, and uh, let me let me launch the poll now. Um, sorry, Levan, uh, I I cannot control the cursor because I think someone else is controlling it. Okay, I've launched, I've launched the Flanders poll, and if I could ask our audience to uh, vote, cast their votes now, I will leave it open for around a minute. Okay, we have uh, 20 people out of 34 who voted already, now 29. So if I could ask uh, the remaining five people to cast their votes, that would be fantastic. Okay, uh, I've closed the poll. So I'm just gonna show you the results very briefly and we will return to them after the last presentation, uh, which we're now going to have. And um, I will give the word now to Matteo from ECI Le Molineau, who will um, uh, tell us about uh, the EC use case, ECI Le Molineau use case. Matteo, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, happy to be here to talk. Uh, the first thing, as you see, ECI Le Moulineau, I'm not sure that all of you know where it is. Uh, to make it really easy from the Eiffel Tower just next to Paris. And then from the Eiffel Tower, if you take the river, you follow the river on the west, you will reach Isile Moulino in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Just to give you a small uh, contextualization about uh, what is about our um, our use case in this uh, in the in the framework of uh, Polyvisu, uh, take into consideration that Isilimulino is a city that had like a real growth, uh, a big growth uh, of the population in the last uh, 25 years, less or more. Uh, that makes that we have today about 70,000 people. Uh, living in Isile Moulino, that makes like almost 20,000 people per square kilometer. That is quite normal for a metropolitan area like uh, ours. And then we have like a lot of people also working in Isile Moulino because uh, the city could attract a lot of companies in the last years, making that the city has quite big density of population, a big density from an economical point of view. And uh, at the same time, it has uh, residents are quite well educated in the use of car, as just a few of them, uh, just 27%, uh, use the car to go to work. Then the point uh, in our policy challenge is to, to identify the reasons uh, the, the, to talk to the people that are not, um, not, are not residents and that they come for various reasons, to Isile Moulino every day, for transit due to the position, or to work due to, to the economic vitality. Uh, then we have like two, um, two, two main things. The first one was information and communication, as I said, to try to, to talk to all the people that pass by or come to Isile Moulino every day. 
and to try also to somehow adjust uh, the situation that is due to the mobility apps that all of us use, like Google Maps or Waze, because uh, to avoid that they become the traffic controller. They have to give information, but we need as a city to take our hands on the, on the management of the traffic. And at the same time, in the city of Isile Mulino, we have the, we have the um, mobility strategies that are related to the ongoing projects that happen due to this uh, vitality and that make uh, that we need to anticipate the needs. If we, we have a lot of residential building management and at the same time we have a lot of, um, we have a big metro project that happened that is happening now and it creates roadworks and then we need to manage all this. Okay, about the data challenges related to this, um, to this, um, to this situation, we have like four main points. The first one, it's, uh, uh, it's probably the most important, is related to the competence, competencies on the uh, territorial competencies because we have uh, a lot of players on the ground, public and private, and then co-creation is absolutely necessary. Then there is a lack of data that is somehow related to this, in the sense that this lack of data is related to the fact that it is fragmented as the competencies. Then it requests often to go to private, private providers that have the data on the whole uh, agglomeration. This is important. And then we have, um, we have, again, we talk about the mobility apps. Again, we have players, our players too, and cities need to work on that and collaborate with them somehow. And then finally, the last point is about data and the business model. Data we found out being coming old quite quickly and is, has, it has costs. Then we need to find a business model between the public and private sector to work about that. What is our solution? Our solution is related to mainly three points. Agreement with two companies, one that provided historical data and one provided an app. And uh, those two agreements allowed us to analyze data on um, analyze the data, historical data, and then the, to, to make use intelligent, uh, intelligent rerouting to allow, uh, me, uh, allow us to, um, to, 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 to work on data. Then we have two tools, one that has been done and created totally uh, from uh, the project, and the second one that is created by one of the companies with which we created the agreement. Then the data that is related to uh, the, the, the tool that was created by the project, that is a dashboard that uses traffic data, it uses traffic data in uh, um, the, about one, of one year. And then that you can see, because we tried to, I tried to cut and paste because it was complicated to have it in just one slide. You can see above, you can define a period a period in which you, you can have also two periods that will be compared in the second section in which you can see a map in which you will see the colors. The, the red means that the situation worsened in, uh, in a period. And then you have uh, the, uh, on, the, on the right, you will see which is the free flow speed. Free flow speed is not the speed limit, but it's how much what's the maximum uh, speed that can be reached in average and then you have the actual speed then the one that was actually that actually happens in the period that was selected and finally below we have the most congested days we can see the most congested days in the period or in the periods that i mentioned the congested road segments and then i can see the division by hour and by day and next to this, once that I have analyzed the data on that dashboard, I can go to the 
application, the MyAnatol application that I was mentioned earlier, that has a control room in which I can put some information that allow me to reroute re the users. Then I can, as an example, avoid them to reroute them in front of a school or in a small street, as often may happen with the Google Maps or Waze. Then, finally, to, to end in all this process, uh, let's say that we have like found out four important uh, elements in why working on a data project like this one. You need to be realistic with your ambitions because you don't have to think too big at the beginning because it's not the best idea because you can you will find too many uh, bottlenecks that will uh, impact your project. Then you need to define local stakeholder groups as it happened in Isili Murino that allowed us to have two local agreements. And those group, those people need to be somehow related to the ground, to the city. Then you need to identify your goals very clearly. You don't have to get, uh, this is again re related to the ambition. It doesn't have to be too big. You need to stay humble and you need to be really focused. And at the end, the data needs, this is again, it's really important because the data need is something that um, has to be strictly related to the goals. You don't have to do to choose a goal that doesn't have data or doesn't have available data somewhere. Then you need to find the actors that have the data, the data first, and then the actors of that have the data if the data is not already in your hands. Thank you. Pavel? I can't hear you, Pavel. Yeah, I'm back. So now I'm back in control of the screen. Thanks, Matteo, for a very interesting presentation of your data challenges and ways to try to solve it. Before we go to the Q&A, uh, let's do one more poll with our audience. Okay, I've just launched our third and final poll about eSIM. So if I could ask everyone in the audience to cast their votes. Okay, 27 out of 32 people voted. I wonder if we can increase that number just a little bit more. 28. Pavel, I noticed that uh, Giorgio Prister has raised uh, his hand. Yeah, so we're going to close this poll now and go into Q&A. Uh, so I think what we can do now is uh, maybe take questions from the audience first uh, before going to the results of the flash polls. Um, now, let me see. Giorgio, hello. Uh, I think you're able to talk now. Um, so feel free to ask a question or comment on what you've just heard. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good afternoon. So I have many questions. Uh, um, well, it was quite interesting, I would say. Um, now, first, uh, you mentioned your free presentation, the word reusable. What is really reusable? Uh, or what can be the ambition of being reusable in other cases? The free cases are quite different. And of course, the cities are different and the needs are different. And, uh, and uh, they all are, let's say, not very big cities, or I, I would even say mid-small-sized mid cities, but interesting cases with students with the, and, and, so, and with the mobility in EDC de Moulineau. 
the second question is about uh, uh, is about the fact that uh, in reality these uh, models have been applied in a period which is not true anymore because uh, we all know that traffic has changed dramatically and in my opinion the the traffic the the mobility will change dramatically in the near future with the much wider use of uh, of uh, personal means not only cars but uh, electrical bicycles scooters and so on instead of or in addition to public transportation and how these models can be reshaped and adapted and uh, also and finally uh, did you buy did you develop um, out of it some simulation models to understand what if if i do or and, and so on um, is it clear what i'm asking yes yeah sure Giorgio. Um, yeah, let me try to answer your three questions. Uh, the first one was about uh, reusability. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities um, for reusing the outcomes of the Polyviso project in general and the three pilots uh, presented um, this afternoon. Um, I think, first of all, um, about, yeah, let's say the approach, uh, the overall approach of policy making, where we uh, let's say have used um, a very traditional way of, uh, of, of policy making with the three uh, phases. Um, but I think the approach of evidence-based policy making where we are, uh, let's say, using um, um, clear policy questions, uh, trying to find the right data to answer those questions, and then also finding the right ways to visualize it and to make it clearly to understand uh, not only for specialists but also for um, policy makers in other fields and uh, at the end also the, the public i think it's it's something really interesting um, i think also on the data perspective um, there is a lot of reusability in a way that we have in fact made a difference between uh, what we call the type of data sets we have studied and used and with type of data sets this can be for example something like floating car data um, coming from from different providers um, auto, automated number plate recognition data uh, is another possibility um, um, data from traffic models is another possibility so a lot of cities are using this kind of data. Um, so by, let's say, explaining the possibilities of those data sets and combining them, that's definitely a lesson learned um, from the project. And I think also about citizen science data, which also provide, uh, in fact, the opportunity uh, to use that on the shelf almost directly in different uh, cities and different regions. And last but not least, of course, we have the, yeah, the dashboards and, and uh, the aspect of linking a dashboard with uh, clear policy goals. I think that's also um, a lesson learned towards uh, reusability. So I think there are um, several ways uh, that the outcomes can be reusable. Um, I think your second question, Giorgio, was about uh, the models. And especially due to COVID-19, uh, yeah, traffic will probably change dramatically. And I share your opinion that it will become probably very difficult times for public transport and that uh, we will shift more uh, in, in towards transport and around neighborhoods by, by bicycle, uh, by moped and, and so on. Um, we don't have a clear answer to that right now, uh, right on the project. But when you're also talking about, let's say, simulation, um, we, in our project, we have a lot of, of, um, of experience with, um, let's say, traffic modeling and bringing traffic modeling um, away from the shelf of the, um, uh, let's say, traffic engineer in the city uh, towards uh, people in other domains, uh, also to, let's say, citizens, so that they can, um, let's say, try to simulate the impact of mobility on um, road networks. And I think especially what I already noticed in a few cities, uh, one example is Brussels in Belgium, where I live, uh, where I live close by, is that um, they are using the COVID-19 to implement more traffic, uh, bicycle lanes, etc. And uh, this kind of measures uh, will of course also affect the flow of the car traffic uh, and, and also public transport uh, traffic probably also. 
Um, so this is something we can already simulate um, with our models uh, by making, let's say, small changes and to see the differences. So I, I hope that, yeah, this is already uh, a first answer on your, uh, on, on your three questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, Levan, maybe if I can uh, stay with you for a second, we had a question from Bishwas uh, who asked uh, what were the resultant policies that were created, recommended from this, uh, from this project? So maybe focusing on Mechlin use case or the Flanders use case, um, you mentioned that um, the results uh, and insights were going to feed directly into the, uh, into the policy making decisions. Yeah. Uh, so maybe you can maybe flesh out a little bit more how exactly the results from Telram were used yeah. To close the streets. Yeah. So yeah. So the school street um, measure is is in fact yeah, something quite new, as I explained in uh, at least in uh, in Belgium. Um, and uh, we in, in fact in Mechelen noticed the immediate immediate effect in a way that um, yeah politicians were very interested um, and also the city in measuring the effects. We noticed that there was uh, an effect in a way that uh, there were more cyclists measured and uh, in fact that the car pressure in the immediate neighborhood uh, was, um, was in fact on the same level than before. So, um, so this is already, let's say, um, a first policy outcome, I have to say, based on only one school. So we want to see also in other uh, schools, uh, school environments in Mechelen, but also in other cities, if this is something that uh, is everywhere the case. So I can't answer that now. Um, but it's in fact already, let's say, um, a first policy outcome. I think secondary, what's also important is that we noticed um, by using citizen science, that it was um, probably more easy to convince um, the city to, let's say, also um, support the action um, because um, it was also, let's say, something where they can come directly in contact with their citizens, uh, where you can build a positive story around. And I think that's also uh, a lessons learned um, in, in this, in, from, from this project. Um, from some other cases we didn't present today, um, I think we, we, we've done some measurements uh, with traffic data, for example, coming from ANPR uh, cameras and, and see the measure, measuring the speeding behavior of, of people. Um, also there we noticed some very positive results um, uh, towards the policymakers' real interest. And I think it can also strengthen certain measures to, to go on with them in, in the future, but, but also there, um, we are looking for cases um, to, let's say, to elaborate um, uh, the results and to see if, these, if those conclusions are expandable to other situations, other cities as well. Yeah, I agree with that, Levan. Um, and I'm, I'm just sharing the results of the Flanders um, uh, flash poll. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, um, uh, co-creation process with citizens, uh, this is uh, this is one point that uh, most uh, uh, people in our audience found uh, very interesting. 62%. Uh, were you are you surprised by the results? How do you feel about um, about the answer? Um, I'm, I'm not very surprised, but I think they are encouraging uh, the fact that yeah, co-creation and working with citizens is something yeah really important to take in mind and to invest on. in, in let's say. Um, in different cases, not only in Flanders, but also beyond in other countries. Um, I think everywhere we, we notice um, the aspect that citizens wants to be involved in, uh, in, in the policy making aspect in, in, in cities. And I think combining that with, um, with evidence based policy making can lead to very, very strong results. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Thanks, Levan. So maybe we can quickly go to uh, to Ghent, Freya, uh, and uh, maybe if I can ask you uh, the same question: uh, How uh, is the city of Ghent planning to reuse uh, the results of the um, student analysis that was carried out in policy making? Uh, what are the plans? And then maybe we'll briefly take a look at the poll results afterwards. <laughs> Um, so the results from the students will be used um, while we, so we work for the Office for Data and Information 
Um, so we have the expertise relevant to data and information, obviously, but we will communicate results with the relevant policymakers and the main experts um, who are responsible for students, student housing, student mobility. Um, and the data will um, help to better understand the policy problem, um, where the students live, and by that open up the discussion more. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And can you see the results of the flash poll? Uh, yes. The data collection process was uh, awarded uh, as, oh. as the most interesting, um, as the most interesting part of the use case by by the majority of today's uh, today's participants. Uh, are you are you surprised by the results, or were you more? No, I, I would have voted the same. <laughs> no. yeah. um, the data collection process is, I think, a very interesting a very relevant part for policy making right now i mean there's a lot of data available within the city um, but also uh, with private partners um, from citizens and i think that finding the right data uh, looking for it and exploring possible um, options data options is a very intriguing process and can be very valuable so thanks freya and um, let's go to you matteo now and uh, uh, I can ask you the same question. How are you in Isle Moulineau are going to use the results uh, of, of your pilot? And then we'll um, quickly take a look at the poll results for EC. Okay. And ju just apologies for interrupting because we have an, uh, an observation on the questions and answer. Maybe you would like to have a look at this or after Matteo will... Um, we'll... Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's take a look at it maybe after Matteo's. Okay. Okay. As we are a bit split on two sides, I mean, in the sense that two sides of our pilot, then they match together in this project, but they are, we can separate them if we want. Let's say that the first part of the dashboard has, uh, is uh, really uh, went through in the sense that today the city is really working on dashboards, not just on mobility, but also on other matters then this, this, let's say that it's fully accepted and then it will go, it will go on. While for uh, Mayanatol, uh, it's a good concept that we are still um, experimenting fully. We strongly believe in it, but there is a point we, we were starting the real, the real testing while the COVID-19 <laughs> blocked us then it's it's still ongoing but the hope is to uh, validate the fact that uh, mobility apps and cities need to collaborate I can't hear you can you see the results of the flashball yeah we have uh, public private agreements uh, uh, voted as, as the most interesting part of the use case. Um, how do you find this answer? Is it more uh, or less uh, uh, it's quite, I see that it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, there is quite a good, the first question, it's, uh, they are not all uh, of the same, uh, they don't, they don't think at the same time. It doesn't surprise me that public private agreements are uh, on top, but also the dashboard is uh, is interesting. Uh, uh, then replicability, yeah, percent. It's quite much. We have quite a few, no, not many. A few don't know, but it's part of the game. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Matteo. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Ken, thanks, thanks for your observation. We will definitely take a look at, uh, uh, at this project that you mentioned, uh, I Consortium. Uh, I don't know if you would like to say something about that. Uh, you're welcome to raise a hand and then you'll be able to speak. Uh, just a second. I will go to, I see Georgia raised a hand and Ken. So I will go to Ken first. Hello, Ken. We can hear you now. Well, uh, yes. And uh, thank you for uh, um, letting me have a moment to speak. Uh, I just posted some information on the chat um, about a project I was involved with um, a few years ago um, that started to look at 
uh, use of data for intelligent transport systems, but to do it in a way that shared data between different um, um, city authorities. Um, so when you think about uh, commuter traffic and the first example of uh, students coming into Ghent, if you want to track data, in, in the case of Ghent, they work with the mobile operator to, to get that data. But there is a lot of data about uh, the transport network, for example, that comes from the cities. So you need to find a way of getting cities to collaborate to, to share that data. And so that um, description I provided talks a little bit about a project that, uh, that managed to do that in a pilot phase and then demonstrated the value and was able to move from pilot into a, a, a commercial operation uh, initially with a few cities and then now operating um, at national scale in the UK. So please have a look and you know, drop me a line if you have any uh, questions um, about that. Uh, yes, definitely. Thanks. We'll, we'll, we will take a look at that. Uh, it does look interesting. Thanks, Ken. And uh, now to, uh, to you, Georgia. Uh, I've just unmuted you, so we should be able to hear you. I apologize. I was playing with my mouse and I raised my hand, but I didn't meant that. Uh, well, your answer were perfect and uh, it's okay for me. Thank you. Sorry for that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, we are at the end of the uh, webinar. So very briefly, I'm just going to say that the case studies that were presented today and more can be found on the Polyvisu toolbox available at this address, policyvisuals.eu. And there, if, um, there you can find, like I mentioned just now, case studies, but also if you have a need, specific policy need, but not sure how to proceed, the toolbox can help you with that as it describes all the processes and policy elements that might be helpful, also more technical aspects such as data sets, tools, and visualization types. And I would like to thank everyone who joined today. Uh, we will be running more webinars uh, in the future. The second one will be in June, and we would appreciate if you could Take a moment to answer a very short survey of only eight questions. Uh, Laura, if I can kindly ask you to paste the link to the Google form in the chat so that participants uh, could uh, leave, leave their feedback there and help us improve uh, for, uh, for the future events. Uh, so once again, thank you. Uh, thanks for your participation. Thanks for um, answering the polls and thanks to all the panelists for their presentations uh, and their answers to the questions. Thank you everyone. Uh, also from my side as a uh, coordinator, I would like to thank you uh, in the name of the whole, uh, the whole Polyviso Consortium. So I hope to see you soon. Uh, during our next webinar, um, we will provide the exact timing, time and date um, in the next days. Thank you. Thank you very, uh, and uh, have a good day. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much.